What do climate models, autonomous driving, and COVID-19 drug discovery have in common? Well, these are all sciences primarily bound by the fastest computing facilities available. Computing speed is a major bottleneck for progress in science and industry. But the development of smaller and better computers has come to a hard physical limit. We are at the dawn of the artificial intelligence revolution. But an ever accelerating growth in information processing would exhaust the global energy production already in 15 years. Given this, it is evident that we run into the limits of contemporary information technology. Already to today, computing requires vast energy resources globally responsible for the same amount of energy consumption and pollution as global air traffic. The stagnation of technological progress is noticeable basically for everybody amongst us. I recently bought a new notebook in order to replace my 10 years old one. And they are roughly at the same speed. Experts call this the end of Moore's law. Moore's law was a prediction in the 1960s that the number of little switches called transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. This is an exponential law, and it was a major driver for digital revolution. Today's chips if the simplest one, run billions of operations per second. So you can just imagine billions of little switch changes per second. And here comes the catch. Every single of this switch requires a tiny amount of energy. And this sums up to an enormous amount of energy per processor. And this energy is converted to lost heat. And this is why your computer gets hot. So computing has a fundamental problem with energy efficiency, and this problem is not easy to overcome. So I claim there's an answer which is fundamentally different to what we are doing today. We have to compute without flipping that many switches, exploiting the fundamental laws of nature instead. We need a mental shift beyond the digital monoculture in order to open the path to sustainable computing. So here's the thing. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I spent 10 years on studying matter under extreme conditions, interacting with gravity or quantum mechanics. And a few years ago, I stumbled upon a very interesting Gedanken experiment, as it is shown here. So scientists discovered that within a narrow range, black holes and waterfalls have something in common. They can be described with the same mathematical equations. So what is actually the analogy here is that while light cannot escape a black hole, that's why it's called black, on a, well, with a narrow conditions, sound cannot climb through the waterfall to the upper basin. So there's an analogy between sound in the waterfall and light in the gravitational system. And this is valuable if you want to learn about black holes, because we cannot create black holes on Earth yet, and we want to study about black holes, and the water laboratory is actually accessible. So we learn about what's happening in the center of our galaxy where there's a very massive black hole just by studying how water behaves. And when I wrote my PhD thesis, my professor did not take me very seriously about the idea that analogies in nature can be exploited for computing very efficiently and very intelligently. Well, it turns out much of industry actually believes that the discrete and serious aspect of computing has to be augmented with a more continuous and parallel approach. So what is digital computing actually good for? Well, digital computing means computing with digits. 
with things which can be represented in discrete little packets, like what you do when you check your bank accounts, balances, or databases, or word processing. You can just um, re imagine every single letter as a discrete amount of information. Or your favorite social network in the internet, perfectly handleable by digital computers. But this is not how the language of nature is written. In science, we deal with relationships which are continuous in time and space. There are no digits. I want to give you ex uh, a few examples. The first one is the brain. Mankind has spent 100 years to develop smaller, faster, and hotter digital computers. The biological evolution, however, has spent millions of years to develop the human brain. It is a supercomputer with the power requirement of a light bulb. So just to put this into numbers, the fastest computer in the world is currently sitting in Japan. It has seven million individual computers. Sounds a lot, right? And it requires 30 megawatt. That's roughly what a mid-sized town requires from energy, right? The human brain, every individual human brain here in this room has 100 billion neurons. So you can just think on every compute core of this computer in Japan, there's another computing center of the same size. So, but the energy requirement of the human brain is 30 watt. It's just a millionth. And the thing is that we think the human brain is much more powerful than this supercomputer. So there is a way how to compute efficiently. The neurons are actually in our brain, they, they implement this, right? They are rather simple in structure, rather slow, rather cold, but very tightly interconnected. They process their inputs continuously and fully in parallel. The whole brain is working at the same time. There is no algorithm in the brain. This is fundamentally different to the architectures of our digital computers. And it's no wonder that there's a wide belief that a real breakthrough in artificial intelligence can only happen with these naturally inspired approaches. Computers that are built to work analog to the human brain. Okay, now I want to give you another example, which is completely orthogonal. Some of you probably heard of quantum computing. It is this very mysterious thing where one exploits these quantum mechanical laws nobody really understands. And, okay, this was exaggerated, right? But, um, so, it's a technology kind of complex and very prospective, however, because it's really, really, really be a game changer of how and what we can compute. But it is still fundamental research. And it requires laboratory conditions. This is very sensitive to perturbations if you want to build a quantum computer. It's very hard to control. And actually, it's quite energy intensive to create these laboratory conditions. For instance, if you need an ultra cool and vacuumized space. We expect the maturity of quantum computing in many years, probably decades. But there are, in fact, analogies available based on much simpler physical principles, which are all around us, such as mechanics or electricity. Today, I want to talk about a proposal which is called electrical analog computers. So what are the common properties of these analog computers? Well, first, they are continuous data flow machines instead of a digit by digit computing. And they work, and cannot do otherwise, but work completely in parallel. Everything happens at the same time, like in the human brain. This means perfect scaling. This is completely the opposite of an intrinsically serial working digital computer with digit after digit after digit. The computation itself becomes a measurement of a well-prepared experiment. This is something we like as physicists experimenting. And the result is non-deterministic. It always has some uncertainty. It is 
or the overall computation is comparatively low precision, but the most energy efficient way of computing available. And this is because nature incidentally solves the mathematical equation of interest without any further ado. It just happens. Okay, so how did I, as a black hole researcher, come to this very crazy topic of building computers or dealing with energies? Well, I have to tell you maybe a little secret. So, I grew up in a house full of ancient computers because my father ran a computer museum. These were these bizarre and huge machines where my sister and me played hide and seek when we were young. Later it turned out that these computers were analog computers. In the 1960s, this was an established industry. Such computers were used for the flight to the moon or for weather forecasts. In the 1970s, however, the digital took off. And this is because digital computing got cheap and mass-produced. And also because they are a bit more general purpose. And also because energy was a no-brainer at that time. It was just not yet a problem. Analog computing got forgotten. Well, sadly, a few years ago my father died. And I was asked by people all over the world to keep up his heritage alive because it was a one-of-a-kind computer collection where all machines were fully operational. And at the preparation of founding a non-profit association, I got in contact to a recognized expert on analog computing. He was able to build modern analog computers that were perfectly suited for my scientific models. And I realized that this exotic technology could catch up with the digital achievements and become, again, an incredibly powerful platform. So last year, together with experts in industry and microchip design, we founded a company to build the next generation of analog computers. But the first thing our deep tech startup addressed was not a technological problem, but a social one. Well, it turns out analog electronics and the word analog in particular is perceived as something from yesterday. When people think of analog, especially the others amongst us, they think of analog television, analog radios, analog landline telephones. But did you know that two-thirds of your smartphone is actually still analog? Analog never went away. It was always amongst us, and it will always be. What we need as a paradigm shift, we need to teach and educate about analog computing. So, in order to do so, we build a thing. It's called the analog thing. <laughs> it is a not-for-profit educational computer, high-quality computer with low-cost and cutting-edge technology. It is offering a number, limit, a number of limited and easily understandable computing elements, supporting a broad range of interesting applications, such as market economies, spread of diseases, population dynamics, chemical or mechanical systems, or even simulating the fear firing of neurons. So let me tell you how this guy works. Actually, it has a secret superpower. It is to solve a particular kind of equations called differential equations. And it's programmed not by writing code, but by wiring circuits with little patch behaviors that solve a system of interest. And after done that, you set the initial conditions for your experiment, you hit go, and it computes analog waveforms, which are the result. And then you can go, attach a monitor, and visualize the result. Or you can actually also digitally post-process it 
with a low-cost digital hardware such as a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. So for this computer, we want to open source it. Actually, we have already open sourced it. We have put all the schematics online. We want to mass produce it soon in order to start an educational campaign and to bring it to hobbyists, to schools, and to universities. Well, okay, we build an educational computer, but our actual vision is quite a bit larger, so we want to bring this computer on a chip of the size of a thumbnail. We will be one of the first which bring analog computing on a microchip. And this chip will no have no more patch cables, right? It will be software programmable. And tomorrow's analog computer will be embedded in every smartphone, every notebook, every computer, every smartwatch in the world. They will be coprocessors and accelerators for compute intensive tasks. And the overall computer will be called a hybrid computer, combining the best of the analog world and the digital world. And the overall computer will have less switches. And then, you remember these little switches representing zero one? It will have less energy demand and at the same time have more computational power. So, who needs such a computer? Okay, it is interesting for both high performance computing and ubiquitous and embedded computing at the same time. With high performance computing, I mean the largest challenges in science and industry, right? Like COVID-19 drug discovery. And we have predicted scientifically that for certain applications, we can replace a 20 megawatt industrial computing center with a 200 watt analog computer. You can just put here next to me. This is really green IT. But what can analog computing do for you? Well, let me give you a few examples. We will be able to build medical implants which are very energy efficient. Think of analog hearing aids or an insulin pump, requiring virtually no battery charge. Or think of the Internet of Things, the future artificial intelligence-driven personal assistant will be analog. Analog computing is an enabler platform for future products, because who knows how the computer will look like in 10 years? I'm coming to the end. It is high time to care about sustainable and green IT by migrating the computing systems to the analog paradigm across the world we can reduce our carbon footprint significantly. After the digital revolution, an analog revolution is next. Thank you. <laughs>